Good morning, all, and welcome to South Cross Community Church in beautiful, although a little bit rainy, Burnsville, Minnesota. Today is November 22nd, the year of our Lord 2020, and this is our 33rd YouTube service. Here we are on the Sunday before Thanksgiving. I am uh, Trace James, the interim pastor here. Would you please join with me as we enjoy together our call to worship from Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. For the Lord, he is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In, in his hands are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. And now we'll continue with worship with our gathering songs, and we'll start with He Has Made Me Glad. Strengthen us in what we do know, 
and keep us ever in your service. We exclaim this praise through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. All right, it's time for announcements. We still have Bible study, I think, planned for tomorrow. Is that going to be true? Okay, we'll still have Bible study with Pastor Chase from 6.30 to 8. If you're interested, just let him know. Um, there will be no confirmation or youth group this week. Youth group, group is taking a little break until January, and so we'll just pray that everybody stays safe. Uh, I'm sure that if you wanted to make sure about the missions piece, that there's other um, Operation Christmas Child that you can still take part. I don't think there's any other announcements. All right, then I'm ready for prayer requests. Um, one of the things about the prayer requests is that it's been an absolute joy to be able to lift up the people who are able to take the time to send them to us. And so continue to do that. Just email me or text me or do whatever, but we would love to be in prayer for you. And we have a, I have a huge praise for our sign outside that tells people to contact the email that we have. Finally, it's going to come to my host and I can actually respond to it. But we got a thank you for a family that we um, prayed for last year as they were going through a very hard time with their sister being very sick with cancer and then actually dying. And she, um, they wanted to say thank you for all the prayers and they said, Dear Vicki and prayer group. So thank you, thank you. And I'll put this up on the bulletin board so you can see that every moment that we spend in prayer is definitely appreciated. All right. Now, we definitely keep praying for Pastor Derek's family and family. And our Pastor Trace had a rough night. And we were so grateful he's here. He had some a scare with the heart piece, heart business, and so he's going to talk to his doctor, and hopefully the doctor will get him uh, squared away. He also tested negative. I know we put out there that he was te being tested for COVID, and he tested negative. Praise God. His daughter is struggling with the, the COVID right now, has a cold and no taste and smell. But we ask for prayers for the rest of the family so they all stay safe and healthy too. Um, Connie, I don't think I said this last week, I don't know when I got it, but her brother-in-law, Fred, is a teacher and he caught COVID and he lives in South Dakota, so prayers for him. And then Connie's Jeff, he um, has a good friend in Elgin that died of COVID this last week. We need major prayers for Nancy's tip because his body, as you know, has been doing some different things after his surgery and he just needs a doctor to talk to him and help him get a plan. So we need prayers that a nurse or somebody will respond to his call. Uh, yep, that looks good there. It'll be your birthdays. We don't have any as we have, that we know of this week, but we do have Erica and Mike, Jennifer's and Dan's relative. Their anniversary is this week. I am going to add on that the distance learning is happening for so many tomorrow and I just want us to be able to lift up all the families who are trying to balance kids and teaching. Not an easy task. Are there any other prayer requests? Did I miss something? All right. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, here we are. We miss our congregation, and we're so grateful for those that tune in. And we know that they're all you're taking care of all of them, so we are so grateful. But Lord, we really enjoyed having them come in those doors. So Lord, as soon as as soon as your will is done uh, for this whole COVID, we'll be so grateful. And we do have so many blessings, and we can thank you so much that we can get a group together to even share the message. So I thank you for every Sunday morning. We are blessed to be able to share your love. And God, I just thank you for the people that are um, 
trying to make the, the right decisions at the right time for when they need to be checked out and taken care of. So thank you for that. Lord, we ask you to be with Erica and Mike and let them just have a fabulous anniversary, even though it's really hard at this time to do some of the things we like to do when we celebrate. We pray that they know that they're cared for and loved. And now, God, we just take a moment of silent prayer to add any others that we have. Oh God, I did forget to Helen's husband, Jim, has to have surgery on a melanoma on the back on the 14th of December. So God, we'll start praying now for the anxiety and the time that it waits. And my mom has to have a tooth removed on the, on the 9th of December. So God, I just pray for them also. We love you, Lord, and we want to do your work. In your son's precious name, amen. And at this time, we normally take our offering and we are going to do that because we're not here, you're there. So if you would be kind enough to send it off to Jean, and the address is in the bulletin. And now we will continue with our worship and we will join in the song, Come Ye Thankful People Come. themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with their hair braided or with gold pearls and expensive clothes, 
but with good works as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. And there ends this reading from God's holy word. Lord, we ask that you would give us understanding of this text. This is the word of God. That is the second time I've ever heard this passage read from the front of a worship center. The first time I heard the passage read was at the uh, federal prison in Rochester, Minnesota. The chaplain there had intended that there be a reading from 2 Timothy 2, but somehow in the bulletin that was passed around, it didn't specify whether it should be 1st or 2nd Timothy. And so the insider that got the job read the passage from 1st Timothy. And thus we all got to hear this passage. A strange and uncomfortable pall settled over the room during the reading. It was as though we were all thinking, Really? Is this strange teaching a word from God? From our God? How embarrassing. And I must admit, hearing the passage today, even though I knew it was coming, knew it, I would be reading it, and intended that it be read, I still experienced the same cold chill as I did on that day at the prison. How can this strange statement be a word from God, the God of love, the God who made heaven and earth and made males and females together, he gave them the authority to be fruitful, to multiply and to fill the earth and together to subdue it and to have dominion over it. How can the Son of God, who assured Mary of Bethany that her desire to know the word of God, to be the one who taught be one that taught the Word of God. This is our lesson from last week. How can the Son of God who assured Mary of Bethany that she would have the opportunity to share God's message of the kingdom to one and all, how can that one who told that woman that her desire was honored and would not be taken away from her also approve and bless a statement like this? And how can the apostle, who we now encouraged many women in ministry and who rejected the proposal two weeks ago, rejected the proposal in 1 Corinthians 14 that women be silent in the churches, also have this message for his protege, Timothy, and for us. I read this passage aloud to some brothers just yesterday in a thing called my renewal group. And one commented, this is the hardest passage of all. Yes, I agree. And perhaps the harder they are, the better they fall. Let's begin our deconstruction of our reading of this passage by questioning some assumptions about the way in which we're reading it. The first is that Paul is again, as in the Corinthian letter, talking about behavior during public worship. There's actually nothing in this passage to suggest that's what he's talking about, and much to suggest otherwise. And two, although it is obvious that Paul meant this general statement to correct some abuse of good order, some something going wrong, Let's realize that the problem is not necessarily a problem which concerns only women as the offenders, but which might under other circumstances also be applied to males as well. So what is the problem? 
And behind that question, what is the actual context? We don't know everything, but we know a bit. We really know quite a bit. Paul was in Europe. He had heard there were problems in Asia, which is the farthest western province, uh, Asia Minor, and more specifically problems around the chief Asian commercial center, which was Ephesus. Normally, Paul would go to the city and settle the problems, which seemed to have to do with what was being taught in some of the Ephesian house churches. Apparently, some really strange teaching had crept into the churches, or some of the churches there, and apostolic authority was needed to sort things out. However, Paul, as we understand it at the time, had an outstanding warrant in Ephesus. If he went there, he'd be put under arrest. He was wanted for being a, quote, disturber of the peace. A far more serious charge then than it would be now. And so he could not go to Asia. Instead, sent a representative. Paul, therefore, sent young Timothy and to find out the way of things, to report back, and then to take appropriate action. Timothy went, found matters were serious enough so that at least some retraining of the elders, the leaders, and the teachers of the house churches was needed. Those who would not be so instructed needed to be replaced. And, and those others, and any who were repentant, they needed instruction in sound doctrine. Under instructions and with the authority of Paul, Timothy announced that this would be the case. Up to this point, I am on solid historical ground. This is what we know. This is the best we know about Timothy's mission to Ephesus. Straighten things out with the elders in Ephesus. We know that during his mission, Timothy wrote to Paul at one point, at least, for further instruction. And we know that the letter part of which we just heard today was Paul's answer to his protege's concerns during his mission. There's one more important fact which will prove relevant. During this time, during this period in Asia, there was a proto-Gnostic movement. It was all over, but especially seemed to settle in Asia. It was a match mash of Eastern mysticism, Greek philosophy, and Jewish thought. The leaders of the sect were predominantly women, and they held to a hackneyed version of the Jewish story, including ideas that Adam had not been deceived by the serpent, which of course he wasn't, Eve was, but he had not been deceived by the serpent, but had been de deceived by a god and that Eve had been given wisdom by the serpent, but had not been deceived, and that although sexual relations were perfectly fine, the women of leaders of the sect served as prostitutes for the male members. Childbearing was strictly forbidden. The idea was that to bear a child was to steal a pure spark of godly spirit and trap it in a human body. This creating more humans was viewed as the worst thing one could do. That is what we know about this proto-Gnostic movement. Gnosticism, of course, is the great second century heresy which tells us that anything having to do with the body is bad or irrelevant and that only things have to do with thought and spirit are good. For the rest, we must fill in. We must imagine. So, imagine with me that Timothy saw what was going on in Ephesus and finally called for a morning when all of those who wish to continue as elders must meet with him and receive instruction in the true faith. Understand, we are making it up as we go. 
putting together a possible immediate context which meets all the points of the passage as we read it just now. So Timothy put together what we would call a class. He gathered these people and began to teach them from his understanding of the actual Jewish Bible, our Old Testament, beginning with the traditions of Israel from Genesis. And then we must imagine, suddenly, as Timothy was speaking, two of the previously penitent leaders, both women wearing braided hair and noticeably provocative attire, stand up and shout Timothy down. They cry. No, no, you lie, you teach falsehood. Eve was not deceived. Adam was deceived by the Creator God. Eve was created first. Eve gained wisdom from the serpent. No, no, you lie. It is you who teach falsehood. An argument ensues with much shouting and confusion, and it takes old Tim a little while to restore order. Eventually, perhaps with some assistance from some of the older men and women who were present, he gets back on track until he gets to the part where Eve gives birth to children, and especially to Seth, in whom she hopes God's promises of redemption will be fulfilled. And again, the two women wearing pearls and gold beads just go crazy on him shrieking about how horrid it is to trap sparks of pure light in muddy, hairy, filthy human bodies. Again, they shout Timothy down. There is much confusion and dissension, and eventually the group is dismissed for the day, and the training is postponed for another time. After this debacle, the distraught Timothy writes to Paul looking for encouragement, further instructions, and support. So Paul gets a desperate message from his protege, which he answers. In this letter, after many words about a reminder and encouragement, quite a bit about folly, dissent, and discord in contrast with orderliness and soundness of the gospel message and the life which proceeds from it. Paul finally comes to the sensitive subject of Timothy's failed seminary class. In as diffident a language as he can use, recognizing how discouraged his young emissary is already, Paul writes, and now I paraphrase what we read before. It is my desire, Tim, that in every place people should pray lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Also, anyone, female or male, who wants to be a teacher in the churches must behave modestly. If women, they should adorn themselves sensibly in apparel that does not draw men's thoughts to their more basic desires, not with braided hair and golden pearls and costly provocative attire. Those women whom you select to be teachers must be known for their good deeds, as befits women or men who claim to have a true faith. Let a woman, just as much as a man, just as much as I did when I studied at the feet of Gamaliel, learn in silence with all submissiveness. I would, not, I would permit no woman to teach who overthrows the authority of her teachers. She is to keep silent, especially when she thinks what she knows is actually an error. For in fact, according to the scriptures, Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not first deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. And in fact, there is nothing at all wrong with Eve or any other woman since having children. In fact, Eve's salvation did come through the child she bore, though after many, many generations. If these women repent of these behaviors and attitudes, as you say one of them has done, and then if she continues in faith and love and holiness with modesty, she may still sit at your feet and learn to teach the truth. See what I've done? I've taken almost, almost the same passage and read it within a different context. One which does not focus on women, per se, but on the respect every student should have for their teachers.
teachers. Indeed, apart from interjecting what I suspect Paul meant about these things applying as much to men as to women, there is only one word which I have changed, and that is the word which is usually translated having authority. Women may not have authority over men. This is, I have it on good authority, is a singularly bad translation. The Greek word rarely used in the New Testament should be rendered seize authority. Exactly the sort of thing I'm describing in my made-up immediate context. Persons shouting down their teacher. Paul said he would never allow such a thing. Indeed, neither would I. And neither would most of the teachers I know allow someone to come in and shout me down, taking over my class, seizing my authority. Sound about right, Vicki? Apparently, that or something like what I describe is what happened. Some woman tried to seize Timothy's authority. So, all right. What if my little story is a complete crock and not at all what exactly happened? This, after all, is a fair possibility. However, take away now my story and you still have the following things. Paul sent Timothy to fix worship in Ephesus by swapping out some elders and by giving them all better training. And something happened in which at least one woman attempted to seize Timothy's authority. That much we know. And so the context of the story is not behavior in worship. It is new elder training at which women were present. Women who just as much as Mary of Bethany had the privilege of being elders in the churches if they passed muster. The rest is conjecture. And to be sure. But again, we have men and women, women and men, this time learning together to be leaders together. Do you see? Women were part of the leadership mix from the advent of Christ Jesus onward. And so it should be today. Men and women together co-equally sharing the burdens and the authority of ministry. Just like God intended from the beginning. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over it together. Male and female. This is still the calling of the people of God, you know. Although the emphasis has shifted a bit over the last few thousand years. Jesus, for instance, we framed it. He said, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Go therefore and make disciples out of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. An important thing for us to remember about the, this last commandment, the one we call the Great Commission, is that it was given to all those who love Jesus, all the males and all the females. When I first had a working title for this sermon, it was, Who are the leaders of the kingdom of God? And so that's the question here at the end. Who are the leaders in the kingdom of God? Those women and those men who are called together to serve together, to instruct, to pray, to work, to weep, to rejoice because God is love. Lord, help us to be a people who each find our calling, our place among your great people, those whom you have called into being because of how you love us. Help us, whether we are men or women, to discover the power and the passion which is serving you. 
wherever we are so called, let us know that, that love. And if there is anyone in our families, male or female, who feels called to the service which is the ministry of your people, let us always encourage and never for any reason discourage their service. And let us all be so full of your grace that we just cannot help but share your story. In Jesus' name, amen. And we will continue with our final hymn, Let All Things Now Living. and sisters be steadfast immovable always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain Amen. 